let's talk about the mindfulness and mindful eating and food. The food we eat literally becomes who we are. You also do intermittent fasting. If you imagine your gut is a highway, if you try to repair a highway when cars are running up and down the highway, it's very difficult. That's why you shut down the highway and you repair it. Do you have a point of view on detoxing? Your body is detoxifying itself constantly. And the question is, how much of a toxic load are you exposing yourself to on a regular basis? Hi, from Round Glass, this is Living with Sunny. I'm your host, Sunny Singh. Today, our guest is Kanchan Koya, and Kanchan is a master of spices. She's a Round Glass teacher in our food vertical. Uh, Kanchan has a PhD from Harvard in biomedical sciences. She's a cookbook author, health coach, and a podcast host. Welcome, Kanchan. Thank you so much, Sunny. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here. Let's talk about the mindfulness and mindful eating and food. And you're big on it. You believe in it. You're big on it. Yeah. Um, my relationship with food and my, I would say, spiritual connection to food, mindfulness around food has definitely been a journey that has evolved over the decades. You know, I've always considered myself a foodie. I really enjoy food and find food extremely pleasurable. I love the tastes and the textures and the nuances. But I think my relationship with food where I recognize that the food we eat really literally becomes who we are. And this is not just sort of the physical biochemical aspects of the food, although those are important, but also sort of the energetics of the food. And, you know, I think something that I really have been thinking a lot about is how many of our ailments or things that challenge us from a disease perspective, I think have arisen because of a disconnection between ourselves and nature. We are one with nature, we are from nature, but yet we sort of think of ourselves as very separate. And so for me, this journey of mindfulness around food has been sort of reconnecting with that integration with nature. So I really believe very strongly that we should eat foods that come from nature as close to nature as possible. I really believe that we should honor where the food comes from. I think the journey that the food has undertaken before it gets into our bodies is really important in terms of how it affects us. And so I think, yeah, it's like sort of a complex, you know, relationship, but I like to think it's constantly evolving. And the ultimate goal is to recognize that food has energy. It has sort of a, a spiritual footprint and that really impacts us beyond just the biochemistry in the food. And I'm always trying to pay attention to that and sort of honor that in my journey as a cook and a huge foodie. So I'm, I'm a foodie too. And, and whenever I travel, I do a good amount of research of where I'm going to eat. Whether it's a hole in a wall, it's a fine dining or fine restaurant, where it doesn't really matter. But I have to have authentic food wherever I go because I believe the connection that you have to have with food is very, very important. You must be aware of what you eat. You must have a connection with your food. Uh, because it becomes you, just like you said. If you look at the everyday person, right, they are, they are not fully aware of what they're putting in their bodies. What can we share with our listeners about building a relationship with your food, knowing what you're eating, uh, and where does, where does it come from and things like that? You know, I think it really boils down to awareness and education. So I think people aren't taught um, that what they eat is important. Um, in medical school, particularly in the West, I have several friends who are medical doctors here in the United States. And I was shocked to learn that the average medical school student spends about 24 to 48 hours in their entire medical training learning about nutrition. The shocking. So they learn about yeah, they learn about pharmaceuticals and prescri prescribing medications and all the disease states, but the nutrition component is so limited. I think it's changing, and there are doctors who are really blazing the trail when it comes to integrating the importance of food as medicine, particularly preventative medicine. But yes, I think it's a huge problem. So I always tell people, you know, the first thing to realize is that you are what you eat. There's really no way around it. So yes, I believe in indulging as well. And I believe that we can get away with some indulgences if most of the time we are honoring ourselves and treating our bodies well, then the indulgences sort of aren't a big deal. 
But I think just recognizing, you know, sort of like articulating to yourself, why do you want to improve your health and why do you want to pay attention to what you eat? Really getting clear on the why. Um, having a deep why, you know, not something like I want to lose five pounds this month. I mean, that's can be a noble goal. But for me, a deep why is I want to be able to show up in this life, share my gifts with the world, show up for the people I love with all the vitality I can muster. That to me is a deep personal why, which gets me really excited about honoring my body through the food I eat. So I think coming up with a deep why, recognizing that there is an indis indisputable connection between what we eat and how we feel and how disease prone or not we are, and then realizing that it doesn't have to be incredibly complicated. So unfortunately, like you said, there is a huge swath of the population that doesn't recognize the importance of what they're eating for health. And then there is a lot of nutrition noise, misinformation, and these diet wars that are sort of overcomplicating the picture. So I always like to go back to the basics. The basics aren't particularly sensational. They don't make for great headlines. But, you know, can we go back to real, whole, unprocessed as much as possible foods from Mother Nature? Wonderful advice. And, and we can talk for the next hour just on this topic, but I want to move on to something a bit more spicy. Spice Spice Baby is the book you, you wrote. And this component of food, let's demystify spices for people because a lot of people has, have this maybe misperception or a understanding the spices about being hot and maybe it's not good for my tummy and you know I should not have too much spicy food and whatnot so there's a lot of there are a lot of opinions out there and let's demystify spices for our listeners yes so demystifying spices for the global home cook was my main mission when I created Spice Spice Baby the blog and then the cookbook so for me, Spice Spice Baby, the book is really a spice resource. It's equal part sort of mini spice encyclopedia and then equal part recipe book. The first 50 pages are really dedicated to highlighting the health benefits of 15 spices. I chose these 15 spices for their ease of access, their versatility, and the ease with which you can incorporate them into sort of global cooking from all over the world. Because not everyone wants to eat Indian food or Thai food or Mexican food or any particular cuisine every day, right? Unless you're from that culture. And I wanted people around the world to be able to assimilate spices into their everyday cooking. And exactly what you said, you know, spices are feared in many global kitchens, especially for people who didn't grow up with them. I don't blame them because if it's an unfamiliar ingredient, sometimes it's just easier not to cook with it. So my mission is to bring those spices from the sort of backs of your pantry to the front so you can start using them in every single thing you make except for chili peppers and maybe the black pepper family. Most spices are not spicy. They are flavorful, aromatic, nuanced, complex with different flavor notes. I agree with you. It's not about the spice being hot. It's about the flavor. It's about, it's about the goodness in it. And, and I love it. You know, it adds to me being food crazy, so to speak. You know, I'm an ultimate, you know, and I'm, I'm on the other, other side of, of being a foodie. Um, when we look at spices, what's the best way Kanchan, to, for, for, a, for a normal person to get educated and keep becoming more aware of spice and their life when it comes to food? What is the best way to educate themselves? I like to recommend people start, especially newbies to spices, kind of begin with maybe five spices, three to five spices that they are going to begin to incorporate into their cooking as seamlessly and effortlessly as they do salt and pepper. I'm happy to list them if you think that will be helpful. I was going to ask you that next, is not only the three spices you think are the best, but I also want to know what are your three most favorite spices? First, I would say for a spice newbie who wants to start using spices more often in their kitchen, I would recommend starting with turmeric. Turmeric is, you know, very trendy. But it is actually um, 
I would say that the trend worthiness of it is warranted. It's been worshipped in ancient medical systems for 5,000 years. In Ayurveda, it was called Jayanti, that which can cure everything, which I think is a little bit of an exaggeration. But it's really, really packed with so many amazing benefits. And it's very mild in flavor, a little bit earthy, a little bit sweet, a slightly bitter. And it goes with so many different things. So if you're making Indian food, of course, there's obvious ways to use it. But if you're not making Indian food, you can do turmeric popcorn. You can do golden milk oatmeal. You can add it to, you know, your everyday lentil soup. You can make turmeric rice. So your everyday staples can be jazzed up with turmeric. The second one I would recommend is cinnamon. It's a familiar spice to most, but unfortunately, we think of it as a holiday spice. It's great in the holidays, but we should be using it year round. There is interesting research on how it can balance blood sugar and improve metabolic health. We know that we are in a crisis when it comes to metabolic dysfunction and metabolic health. So anything we can do to improve our insulin sensitivity and our metabolic health is of interest. Um, I love adding it to sweet and savory dishes. If I'm making lentil tacos or roasted sweet potatoes, I'll add cinnamon, um, Obviously, I love adding it to things like oatmeal, banana bread, pancakes. Um, even my tea and coffee is just super delicious with cinnamon. So that's the second one. And then the third one I would say is sumac. So sumac is a spice I didn't grow up with in India. It's one of my favorites. So that's an overlapping answer to your questions. Um, it's packed with antioxidants. That beautiful purple hue in sumac is indicative that it contains these compounds called anthocyanins which are showing real promise for cardiovascular disease and as anti-inflammatory agents, it's very easy to use. So if you've ever been to a Middle Eastern restaurant and you've seen that sort of purple powder sprinkled on hummus or baba ganoush, that's sumac, you can sprinkle it on all your salads every single day, wonderful on any kind of dip like hummus, baba ganoush, or any other dip you make. Um, really, really easy to use. So for that reason, I would say those three spices would be my starting point. And then obviously I could, you know, extend that list forevermore if we had enough time. Let's talk about you also do intermittent fasting and it's a big trend. A lot of people are into it in your life. How are you incorporating fasting? And if you have an opinion or two you'd love to share, uh, advice you'd like to share with our with our listeners. Absolutely. Um, so I grew up in India where a lot of my family members fasted for religious reasons. Being the foodie that I am, I never thought I would fast. I thought the idea of intentionally abstaining from eating delicious food for a prolonged period of time was just not for me. Um, but I was also really interested in health and science. And I stumbled upon some really fascinating research around the benefits of fasting. So, you know, our hunter-gatherer ancestors fasted out of necessity because they couldn't always hunt and gather. And I would argue that in modern times, most of us can gather more than enough, very often more than we need amounts of food. And this is where fasting kind of comes in. So it turns out that in the short term, fasting, just like exercise, is a short-term stress on the body but this can improve our resilience in the long run. Um, I have experimented with many different forms of intermittent fasting. I don't think there is one perfect way to practice it, but I think the idea and intention of giving your system a break of at least 13 hours overnight from food, and I pick 13 hours because there's some really interesting research in the cancer space around how taking a break from food overnight for about 13 hours can be beneficial. So even if all you do is finish dinner by 8 p.m. and then break your fast the next morning by 9 a.m., you've actually practiced a fast. You haven't eaten for 13 hours. And it turns out when we don't eat for 13 hours or 16 hours or whatever, yes, our body has a chance to repair itself, to digest and assimilate nutrients more efficiently. One of the best analogies I heard was from Dr. Sachin Panda at the Salk Institute, who's sort of the father of time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting. He said, it's like, you know, if you imagine your gut is a highway, if you try to repair a highway when cars are running up and down the highway, it's very difficult. That's why you shut down the highway and you repair it. 
And our body can engage in that kind of repair on a daily basis, but not if we're constantly having cars, i.e. food and metabolites running through the highway. So taking a break from food is really, really helpful. Intuitively, I think we can all kind of relate to that. And then there's like really cool science now on, you know, what happens at 16 hours, 18 hours, maybe multi-day fast. So I practice a t- a fasting almost every day of about 15 to 16 hours. That's just naturally where I feel good. I find it helps me have more energy, more mental clarity. I finish dinner early by 7 or 8 p.m. That helps me sleep better. I feel like it improved my gut health. And then I actually do practice a five-day fasting mimicking diet three times a year. It's research-backed. It's very interesting. And I do that for some of the deeper benefits of longer fasts, particularly something called autophagy, where your body literally starts to engage in sort of a deep cellular cleanup. Um, And all of those things, I would say, have really impacted my well-being in a deep way, which is why, in addition to my love of spices, I'm often talking about fasting and its benefits as well. And and, and Kanchan also... You know, I've done many detox. Uh, I've done Ayurvedic detox. I've done regular detox. Um, that also plays this whole idea of fasting and detox plays together. Uh, do you have a point of view on detoxing? So I do. Um, I I like to remind people that our bodies are engaged in detoxification twenty four hours a day. So this idea that we will sort of engage in a detox is a little bit misinformed. That said, you can do things like an Ayurvedic detox where you're really aiding those detoxification pathways. So you're taking away things that are a burden on the detox pathways like the liver. So people who might do a 30-day cleanse where they avoid refined sugar, alcohol, things that are really difficult for the liver to process, um, that is aiding detoxification. But your body is detoxifying itself constantly. And the question is, how much of a toxic load are you exposing yourself to on a regular basis? If it's very high, then you might have to do these sort of very intentional focused detoxes. But if you're living, if you're treating yourself, you know, well, and really honoring yourself and honoring your detox organs on a consistent basis, then I don't think you necessarily have to do a detox because you're supporting your natural detoxification processes every single day. Last topic I want to talk about, Kanchan, is longevity and food. You know, a lot of people, longevity is, again, another fad, another hot topic. People want to live longer. But you can't just live longer and live a great long life by just doing everything you're just so pleased. You have to discipline yourself in many, many ways. It's a work. You have to put the effort into it. The strongest data we have around foods that can support longevity come from cultures and people that tend to live long, healthy lives, also known as the blue zones. Um, Of course, we have a lot of lab studies, but it's difficult to design good controlled experiments where you're following people for their entire lives and seeing what they ate and what they didn't eat. So I think eat. So these blue zones, I think, are very educational. If you're interested in longevity, it really does seem like a plant predominant diet seems to be the way to go. And it makes sense because plants come packed with these polyphenols, phytonutrients, beneficial plant-based compounds that can prevent disease and reduce and, and reduce the rate of aging. Um, they also have fiber, which really nourishes our gut microbiome. And that seems to be really important in longevity as well. So I would say back to the basics, plant predominant diet, eat the rainbow. And, you know, the Mediterranean diet, especially in a plant predominant fashion, I think is a really good framework that seems to fit with all of these blue zones, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, healthy fats. And something we forget, you know, we talk a lot about the food we eat, but also sort of our raison d'etre or our sort of reason for why we wake up in the morning seems to be really, really important in these blue zones as well. It really seems like they have a strong sense of purpose, a mission in life, usually that extends beyond just themselves, something they're working towards, a problem they're trying to solve. And I personally think that might be one of the most important factors in longevity beyond just what's on your plate. Build a relationship with food. Become more aware of what you're putting in your body because it helps with detoxing, it helps with longevity, it helps with your 
just overall state of being, just being happier. I, I fundamentally believe, and it's come out of this conversation, that food makes you happy. Eating the right food makes you feel good. Feeling good makes you feel happy. And so, Kanchan, what a fascinating conversation. I could, I could go on and on and on. We have limited time. Uh, perhaps another conversation in the very near future where we'll build upon what we talked today, but basically spice up your life. Absolutely. Spice up your health, spice up your life, find pleasure in eating well and honoring your body and everything else will fall into place. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really an incredible conversation. Great questions. Great to be here. For more information on Kanchan, please go to uh, roundglass.com. Uh, this is Round Glass, and we are Holistic Wellbeing. I am Sunny Singh, and I am Holistic Wellbeing. Thank you, Kanchan. Thank you. We want to hear from you. It is about your journey of holistic well-being. If you have any questions, you have any feedback, do write to us. Email us at livingwithsunny at roundglass.com. We're delighted to join the show. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe. We'll see you next time.